the Y Nicola setup <coughs> the presentation. So uh, if you are connected on Zoom, uh, please wait until the end of the presentation to ask the question, and then raise your hand, and we will unmute you, and then you can we will be allowed to ask the question. Um, Yeah, very good. Can you hear me? Yes, looks like. Okay, so very, very happy to be here. I changed the title at the last, uh, at the last moment uh, uh, to give this, uh, I would say, introductory talk uh, to the world uh, of, uh, as Antimo called it, uh, the uh, Vanier ecosystem. So, uh, you know, I prepared a very introductory lecture to make sure uh, everyone is on the same uh, footing. Uh, but I decided also to spend uh, a few slides uh, um, on sort of an historical perspective. I think, you know, uh, for better or for worse, uh, everyone here is uh, much, much uh, younger uh, than I was, and it's probably as the age when I started uh, doing this. Uh, and uh, ICTP is a special place uh, for the electronic structure community uh, for many reasons, uh, for the research that was going on here at the Dipartimento di Fisica Teorica, just two floors upstairs, uh, at the International School for Advanced Studies, uh, uh, but also because uh, there was and there is an uh, event every two years, uh, the, the workshop on uh, electronic structure methods and application uh, that uh, started uh, in 1987. And, you know, it was uh, for many, many years uh, the single focal point uh, for not only the European community, but also many of our, uh, say, friends uh, and colleagues in the United States, uh, in Asia, uh, and, uh, and elsewhere. So I actually wanted to start uh, giving you uh, a little bit of the sense of, you know, the excitement uh, uh, for the field many, many years ago. So I, 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 I'm jumping back, uh, actually, uh, to 1979, uh, and I, I chose this because, again, it's like a, a selected history of, uh, you know, the, the, the works that really made an impression for me, but this is really, you know, Marvin Cohen and collaborator, Jason Hem, uh, now in Seoul, and Alex Zunger in Colorado, uh, really putting together uh, the formalism of, uh, you know, something that many of us uh, still use today, that is, uh, you know, the total energy, plane wave, uh, pseudo-potential method. Of course, this is not the only, you know, uh, methodology in electronic structure calculations, uh, uh, but it's one that really had a major impact. And, you know, this was already shown a year later in 1980s, uh, again by Marvin Cohen, uh, calculating actually with the LDA the different uh, phases of uh, silicon. You know, so these are the equation of state, uh, discovering uh, that silicon uh, ambient pressure wants to be uh, in the diamond phase, but also figuring out from the common tangent uh, the transition, the the pressure uh, at which it becomes a beta thin. And, you know, I often see, you know, if you look at this picture in 1980, you know, you would understand uh, what is happening, uh, you know, 40, 50 years later, all, you know, the materials genome and the application of electronic structure calculations uh, to material science. Uh, it was uh, all in there. Uh, another sort of, uh, you know, layer of excitement uh, uh, Haman Schluter Chang in 1978 uh, came out uh, with this uh, concept of non-conserving pseudopotentials, uh, ensuring uh, transferability. And so all of a sudden, uh, we had also the tools uh, to describe uh, with this uh, total energy pseudopotential method, uh, uh, you know, atoms of all sorts. And, you know, again, this uh, at the time uh, very often cited paper by Bachelet, Haman, and Schluter, uh, the list of uh, pseudopotentials for all 92 elements uh, in the periodic table. And again, you know, some uh, local excitement here. I mean, again, most of you are familiar uh, with these papers, uh, but actually I sort of was very happy to point out. Uh, you see, they were done just uh, two floors above here in the Dipartimento di Fisica Teorica, both uh, Karen Parinello uh, coming up uh, with their uh, unified approach for molecular dynamics and density functional theory, and Stefano Baroni and co-workers uh, with uh, linear response theory, density functional perturbation theory. So, you know, the 80s uh, were really sort of putting down the seeds, laying the ground uh, for the great uh, excitement uh, that, uh, you know, there was and there is uh, for, uh, for this field. 
And uh, I think uh, everything uh, seemed uh, possible, and you know, it was uh, taking place uh, on uh, there were a row of terminals uh, around ICTPs of this digital VT100 terminal. That's how you would do calculation uh, at the time, uh, running on the VAX uh, mini computer. And uh, as I say, early 90s, that is when I started doing electronic salsa calculation, uh, there was the feeling uh, that really the sky was the limit uh, because uh, not only we could study accurately materials, not only we could study all materials, uh, but also, you know, the, the, the problem that had hampered calculations of, you know, going towards a very large scale system uh, seemed uh, uh, very manageable. And these are some of the early ideas about uh, large scale electronic structure calculations. Uh, but in particular, I think uh, there was a session at the 1993 uh, APS March meeting in Seattle uh, that felt a little bit like the 1987 superconductivity meeting. Uh, where in a small room, I think, uh, uh, there were a lot of presentation, uh, all brimming uh, with new ideas uh, about uh, linear scaling, how to deal uh, with a very large uh, scale system, how to escape uh, the cubic scaling of orthonormalization. So you see here Linunes uh, and Vanderbilt, uh, Maure Gallicar, and uh, Jorge Hondra, Grumbang, and Martins. I just pick up uh, some of the uh, representative papers to say, you know, Already, and it's really 30 years ago, it seemed that the uh, calculation of electronic such um, properties for uh, complex uh, systems uh, were really uh, within reach. Uh, I just started my PhD, so I, I wasn't at the uh, APS March meeting uh, in uh, Seattle, uh, but just uh, the, the week after, uh, uh, I had uh, Francesco Mauri that I was just uh, visiting, returning from the Seattle March meeting, uh, telling me everything about uh, this linear scaling session. We were driving from Cambridge uh, to London uh, to listen to Peleas and Melisande, Claudia Bado. And uh, in case you don't have any scientific questions uh, during the time allotted for question, you can ask me about uh, the UK speed limits. But so I got really excited about, uh, you know, this, this new frontier, this uh, linear scaling approaches. And so when, uh, you know, a couple of years later I was finishing my PhD, and I approached David uh, because, uh, David Vanderbilt, uh, because uh, I was really, really keen uh, to work uh, uh, with him uh, because of all, you know, the, the major advances uh, that, uh, that uh, he had made and, you know, he sort of offered me a position, but then he mentioned uh, the fact that there was actually uh, an NSF call uh, from the computer science and engineering division uh, for a postdoctoral uh, research associate uh, in computational science and engineering. And so he said, uh, you know, why don't we apply also for a grant like this uh, together? Uh, it, could be, it, could be, it could be fun. And, uh, you know, discussing, I said, you know, I really want to do linear scaling. This is, uh, this is uh, what, uh, what, you know, will bring um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of progress. So we agree, you see the deadline, you can read it here, it was uh, November 1st. So around uh, mid-October, David writes to me and says, how is the grant uh, going? And of course, uh, then I start writing the grant. Uh, and uh, three days later, I write uh, to him uh, with you know, a lot of anxiety. This is you know, the early days of emails, basically. So you know, contacts uh, were still uh, sparse uh, somehow. And uh, I send it to him. And uh, you know, I, was, uh, I was very, very happy. I said, OK, it's, it's very good. So, um, he had a comment uh, that is very typical to, uh, uh, for David. I actually had a chance to ask permission to post it uh, this uh, beforehand. Otherwise, I would have shown it uh, nevertheless. But I remember this sentence uh, for uh, many years. He commented on the draft uh, saying, I would lower the verbal temperature to a few degrees uh, just to make sure I was uh, you know, uh, a little bit uh, more coherent uh, in my expectations. Uh, anyhow, it all uh, worked well, so we got, uh, we got the grant, and off I go to Rutgers, and, uh, you know, the plan was uh, to start uh, working on this linear scaling project. Huh? And, you know, David said, thinking about this, uh, you know, all these linear scaling ideas uh, uh, are actually related to the fact that you escape uh, this uh, orthonormalization costs uh, because you work in representation uh, where the orbitals are localized, so you don't have uh, to calculate uh, the scalar products. Uh, but actually, we don't know really under which condition, how much uh, 
uh, these orbitals are localized. Of course, there were, you know, the, the uh, initial works uh, by uh, Walter Cohn of uh, localization, uh, and, uh, and, you know, there was an entire sort of theoretical uh, literature on this. Uh, but, you know, the thought is that we should uh, explore it uh, a bit uh, more. And for that, uh, we actually used, uh, you know, the other uh, major and exciting uh, advance uh, of those years uh, that was really uh, the capability of uh, calculating, uh, say, the polarization in solids uh, as a berry phase. These, again, are two of the pioneering papers. Raffaele was also soon to move to the Departamento di Fisica Teorica. But uh, in particular, you know, the connection that was very important is that uh, we finally had a, a well-defined uh, mathematical and algorithmic ways uh, to deal with the position operator in solids and then uh, with all its power, the, the, the square and so on. And so that was really the, the, the last technical step that uh, we needed to discuss uh, actually localization of an orbital uh, described in periodic boundary condition. So to explain a, a little bit uh, these concepts, uh, let me again, you know, just uh, uh, use uh, a few slides that go back uh, to the basics. Uh, this is actually uh, a book, uh, the, the, the book, uh, the first book of Poetics of Aristotle that I bought uh, uh, at the Rutgers uh, bookshop uh, one Sunday that I was feeling uh, particularly forlorn. And uh, it was the Penguin edition, uh, all in English, translated in English. I open it up and the first page uh, says, let us as nature directs begin first with first principles. So this was clearly a message, if not from God directly, but from Aristotle, uh, tell me that, you know, I should just uh, keep, uh, keep, uh, keep going. So let me actually sort of set the stage and the nomenclature. Again, apologies, most of this is familiar to you, but just to make sure that everyone here and home sort of follows from, from the beginning. And we start from Bloch theorem that, of course, states what are the symmetry properties of eigenstates of an Hamiltonian uh, in a periodic lattice, uh, so you have the kinetic energy, you have the external potential. If it's a, you know, Konosham Hamiltonian, you have also the heart exchange correlation. But basically everything is periodic, and so the Hamiltonian uh, commutes uh, with all the lattice uh, translations. That doesn't mean that the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian are periodic, uh, but it means uh, that they can be chosen uh, to have uh, the block form, uh, that is, uh, uh, this uh, eigenstate uh, psi of n k are going to be the product of a periodic function u n k times uh, a modulation, a plane wave modulation e to the i k dot r, lowercase r. So this is all function of, uh, of space. And the symmetry labels, uh, the quantum numbers, uh, are the band index n, a discrete band index, uh, and a continuum index k, that is the quasi-momentum uh, that is uh, chosen to be inside uh, the first Brian zone. It's actually fairly easy to prove this. Uh, I, I will not uh, go through it. Uh, many textbooks do it very nicely, but uh, uh, in practice, uh, one simple way to do this uh, is uh, asking the two requirements that a translation cannot change the charge density. And of course, uh, if you calculate a psi square, that e to the i k dot r phase factor uh, goes away, and so you only keep uh, the u and k periodic uh, uh, part uh, squared, uh, and also use that two translation are equivalent uh, to the sum of the two. So we have, uh, you know, this uh, form, uh, this symmet symmetry-driven form for uh, uh, the eigenstates, uh, and uh, what does it mean? I think I borrowed this uh, slide uh, from, uh, uh, from David. Uh, what does it mean if we have, a, say, let's take a one band, this red band, so maybe n is equal to one, k lives in the first Abrian zone of this uh, one-dimensional system, uh, so each point uh, along uh, the red band is uh, one state uh, for our system, and uh, if we cho choose the k equal to zero uh, state, uh, well, the modulation uh, then disappears, uh, and uh, the wave function psi is actually periodic. You see the, the, the black curve here. Uh, something that looks atomic-like, it looks a bit uh, 
like a p orbital sitting on the blue atom, uh, periodically repeated. But if you move away from the center of the Bruen zone, uh, you know, this uh, k going towards, uh, uh, you know, the zone boundary, you start uh, to have a modulation that become uh, shorter and shorter in wavelength, uh, and so that uh, periodic function that in any case is different is not going to be uh, the one that we had for k equal to zero is going to be slightly different, but is modulated. So these are, uh, you know, the ingredients, and this is what uh, our electronic structure code uh, calculates. And uh, the idea was, uh, you know, to try and uh, take uh, this uh, ingredients, uh, this uh, psi and k, and uh, transform them uh, through unitary transformation into a different representation. So we wanted uh, to move away from the block representations, the one, you know, driven by the symmetry with respect to the translation, into a real space localized form. Of course, something that conceptually had been introduced by Gregory Vanier uh, in 1937 uh, through this Vanier transformation written here on top. So, you know, if there is a, a formula that you want to remember for a while, is this uh, that is, uh, we perform, it's, you see it's a continuous unitary transformation, but we take, uh, uh, say, for a given n, <coughs> for a given band, and, uh, you know, let's uh, see in a moment uh, what it means in more complex cases, but let's take uh, maybe this band here for, from a semiconductor, the bottom uh, valence, and let's transform it uh, with this uh, Fourier transform, uh, where we integrate uh, psi and k all through the Brillouin zone, uh, with a phase uh, factor, uh, e to the minus i k, where k is varying across the Brillouin zone, uh, capital R. So where R now is not a space variable, but is a direct uh, vector, direct uh, Bravé lattice vector. So in this transformation, if we want, uh, we remove uh, the dependence on k, and uh, we create uh, a dependence on capital R, the symmetry properties of these uh, resulting uh, Vanier functions uh, will be discussed actually in a moment, uh, but the idea that I'll try to introduce heuristically is that uh, these objects, uh, rather than uh, being, uh, as we had seen here, delocalized in real space, uh, you know, everywhere, uh, were going to be localized. Now, the concept of Vanier function, of course, uh, you know, became very useful very quickly in solid state uh, physics, uh, uh, but the practice of, of Vanier function uh, lagged behind for a number of reasons. First, uh, maybe there wasn't really uh, very good models uh, for this uh, psi and k, uh, but most importantly, there is actually an arbitrariness in the definition of this uh, Vanier function that I'm showing here in the simplest uh, way possible, and it's what we call a gauge uh, freedom. That is, uh, the, the Schrodinger equation uh, doesn't uh, fix uh, an arbitrary phase factor uh, for every point, uh, for every state along uh, those uh, red lines. So if psi and k is a good eigenstate of our Schrodinger equation, well, anything, I'm sorry, the psi and k multiplied by any arbitrary phase is also going to be a good solution to the Schrodinger equation. The expectation values for our Hamiltonian are not going to be affected or all expectation values because those phases cancel out, but the representation is actually going to be different. And so the actual shape of this R and uh, Vanier function uh, is going uh, to change uh, depending uh, on uh, whatever phase uh, we have here. And so if you were to calculate, uh, you know, in a natural electronic structure calculation, this Vanier function, uh, say you don't put any phase, but you just get uh, the psi and k out of your electronic structure code, uh, um, typically at every different n and k, they will have uh, arbitrary phases, uh, so there will be a randomness uh, in k uh, that it's not going to help. In general, in the theory of Fourier transforms, uh, uh, what you want is uh, you want uh, this object uh, in square parentheses uh, to be very smooth in K, so that is Fourier transform is very localized, uh, 
and that these continuities uh, um, would actually give rise uh, to uh, a longer range of behavior or actually not localization at all. That is, if you were to calculate the Vanier function with the psi and k as uh, thrown out uh, by an electronic search code, you will not get something localized at all. I'm not going to demonstrate uh, that the Vanier functions uh, are localized, but I just give you a very simple heuristic argument uh, of uh, you know, maybe why they could, uh, they could be. And so I take uh, a special case in which, uh, uh, say, the, we have only one band, so there is no index n, and uh, we look uh, at the Vanier function that is based in the cell where capital R is actually gamma, is at the origin. So the Vanier function that should be at the origin, so the E minus I K capital R in the Fourier transform, in the Vanier transform, is equal to one, and so we are left uh, with this integral, okay? And now we are going to see what values uh, this uh, Vanier function takes uh, at actually uh, Bravais lattice vectors. So, so we calculate uh, this, uh, uh, say, home Vanier functions uh, at different points, uh, uh, capital R of I, where R of I is a Bravais lattice vector. And so if we look at the definition, and we are calculating this at, uh, you know, capital Ri, because the UK is periodic, we can just have the UK of zero. And so from this, uh, you can sort of see uh, that uh, as you make uh, this integral in K, if there are no weird discontinuities here, you know, this uh, phase factor, as R becomes larger and larger and larger, as I move away from the origin, uh, will give rise, uh, you know, to very, very, very fast oscillations that, if you are lucky, are actually, on average, are going to give you zero. Now, if there is any mathematician in the room, I'm sure they will be horrified, but sort of this is uh, just to give you a little bit of the sense of uh, why this should be localized. Now, of course, uh, uh, there is uh, one additional degree of freedom in our calculation. Let's take an insulator. Uh, the charge density, the energies, uh, have actually a further gauge freedom, that is, uh, the charge density, say, is uh, invariant uh, if uh, we actually transform at every K point uh, our uh, sort of set of occupied orbitals. Here I would have a case of, say, let's two occupied bands, uh, let maybe take uh, Psi 1 and Psi 2, at a certain k point here, you know, the zone boundary, pi over a, uh, if I perform a, a two by two unitary transformation, is a little bit like an orthogonal transformation, but just uh, for a complex Hilbert space, uh, what happens uh, is actually, again, my charge density doesn't change, my total energy doesn't uh, change. And so if you want, uh, we have an additional uh, gauge freedom that is, uh, at every point in the Brian zone, for an insulator, let's take a gallium arsenide, let's take silicon here, at every K point, so not only we have the freedom to choose an arbitrary band at every point, but we have the freedom to mix, in this case, all the four bands together, say at the X point, we can mix them between each other with a four by four matrix, and so we can get for a new psi prime mk uh, that can go very well into the Vanier definition. Or of course uh, we could have decided that uh, we want only to mix uh, these uh, three bands together. So for this one we would only have to change phase factors uh, and for these three we have to choose uh, at every k point uh, a three by three matrix. So this is really the, the, the last formula you need to remember that is uh, we want to do a Vanier transformation of our eigenstates uh, and the gauge of freedom that we have is at every k point, uh, we have uh, a number of bands, a uh, time number of bands, uh, unitary matrices uh, that mixes all of them uh, uh, together. And so the question now is, uh, well, the choice of u that is up to us uh, will affect uh, the shape of Rn and basically uh, the more uh, we choose uh, these uh, rotations uh, such that uh, the resulting uh, 
states uh, here uh, give rise uh, to a very, very smooth dependence uh, as a function of t k as you integrate things, uh, you are going to get more and more localized orbitals. So you really want to ch choose, uh, let's again think of this four by four transformation of these uh, four bands uh, in silicon at every k point, uh, such as the new four uh, transformed orbitals uh, as a function of k are very, very smooth, uh, and they give rise uh, to very localized uh, uh, Vanier functions. So now we have stated the problem, solving a problem, you know, half of the work is actually stating uh, what the problem here, so the rest uh, is uh, just a little bit of uh, numerics, uh, if you want. So how do we choose uh, the U properties? Oh, actually, yeah, let me uh, remind you what were the properties of these uh, uh, Vanier functions uh, uh, that uh, uh, Gregory Vanier defined, and uh, because they, there is a double unitary transformation, they are basically the Vanier function span the same space as uh, uh, are occupied orbitals. Uh, if we change the R uh, in that uh, phase factor, the capital R, into R plus R prime, the resulting Vanier function uh, will just be a translation of the one that we had for R, and they are all orthonormal between each other. So this is true no matter what the U's are, but we want uh, to choose the U's uh, to make uh, this uh, Rn Vanier function uh, as meaningful as possible. Now there is a, a very simple way uh, and very intuitive way uh, to choose uh, the U's, and this is, uh, I guess, is a graphical representation of uh, what we were actually aiming uh, to obtain. Uh, we would wanted, you know, to find the mixing at every k point of the four bands uh, to give something, this is gallium arsenide, uh, that is uh, very localized and represent uh, all this Hilbert space here of these four bands, uh, but maybe we wanted just to transform uh, this single band and get something here, or we wanted to transform uh, these uh, three bands here. So how to choose uh, this uh, set of matrices? Well, there is a, a very simple and very intuitive uh, uh, recipe that uh, uses uh, projections. Uh, let us suppose that you have a physical idea of what your end result uh, should be. You sort of you know, figure out uh, that uh, in uh, silicon or in gallium arsenide, you have these four bands. You have really four uh, covalent bonds in the unit cell. Uh, so you should have something that looks like a, a covalent bond. And so what you can decide is that you can take, uh, you know, projection onto four uh, covalent bond uh, orbitals, like, uh, you know, you choose uh, four uh, G function uh, that's set in the middle of the bonds, uh, a bit like a sphere. But say, if, if you define G functions uh, in this, uh, in this uh, expression, well, then uh, the resulting uh, phi uh, defined uh, through this uh, projection uh, are actually going to be uh, the same uh, irrespective uh, of whatever uh, U unitary transformation I apply to the psi. You see, if I send a psi into psi U dagger and uh, say psi bra into U psi, the U dagger U cancels out. Uh, so all these, uh, you know, phase uh, problems and unitary uh, rotations problems that I had uh, disappears. Uh, and so these objects uh, are actually independent of the arbitrary phases. They depend just on my choice of localized orbitals. If I make sure uh, through some algebra and the loading transformation that this is actually a proper unitary transformation, I have phi uh, that I can uh, uh, Vanier transform and get my localized Vanier uh, uh, function. And that's actually a very good uh, heuristic approach uh, to do this. Uh, but uh, we didn't really want to be heuristic because we really wanted to understand uh, the true localization properties of our system um, in order to you know, uh, understand a little bit more how this uh, uh, linear scaling approaches worked. And so you know, we came out uh, with uh, what uh, you know, is, uh, of course, a very um, straightforward uh, suggestion uh, that comes on the strength of, uh, you know, the Berry phase theory of polarizations, the capability of calculating uh, 
meaningfully the uh, position operator and its power, because then it becomes uh, possible to define the, a very simple measure of localization of, uh, of orbitals uh, that is just uh, uh, the sum uh, of their uh, spread around uh, their centers. Uh, and uh, that turns out to be, you know, again, for uh, the four uh, Vanier functions uh, in silicon that represents the four occupied bands, uh, the sum of these uh, four uh, spreads uh, around uh, their centers. So it would be the expectation values of uh, uh, R minus uh, the, the center squared, uh, and that, uh, that, that what comes out uh, as uh, this uh, localization criterion. Um, actually, I have to say, at the time, uh, you know, we came out uh, with this as the most natural choice, uh, uh, and uh, it was, I mean, it wasn't really pre-internet, but it was uh, pre-digitalization of scientific papers, uh, so doing uh, bibliographic searches was much harder, uh, but uh, I was sharing the office uh, for a few months uh, with um, a chemistry from Delaware, Doug Doran, uh, and because he was a chemist, uh, you know, when David and him talked, he says, well, you know that uh, actually uh, this, uh, this has uh, been uh, studied extensively in the chemistry literature, and so actually uh, there is a long history in the 60s uh, of localization criterion um, for uh, orbitals in quantum chemistry, um, in part driven by the desire to have, again, more meaningful representation of the chemical bonds, in part in order to make the calculations there, again, uh, be less uh, expensive, and so we actually added uh, all this uh, chemistry literature. But somehow for finite system, this is a, a, a very easy problem to deal with uh, because you don't have uh, these conceptual issues of calculating uh, uh, the position operator. The difficulty was coming from the solid state, but we said, you know, this is the localization criterion that we defined, and at this point, uh, you know, we can state uh, that the driving force to choose this gauge freedom, so these U matrices, is that they should be such so that the resulting Vanier function, the one in this case in the home unit cell, the zero N, the four Vanier function for silicon, are as localized as possible. And so to do this, uh, so sorry, let me actually sort of you know, summarize where we are. So the, the idea is that, uh, you know, we are going to get uh, block states uh, from an electronic structure code. Uh, we are going uh, uh, to perform uh, this uh, uh, integral and this uh, finite sum. They are sort of two unitary transformation. But we are going to find out uh, what are uh, these uh, uh, gauge uh, freedoms uh, such that uh, the resulting uh, Vanier function are as localized as possible. And so basically we needed to, you know, figure out uh, how does the localization functional omega uh, depends on our uh, psi initial states uh, and uh, on our uh, arbitrary U matrices. Now the choice of the localization functional as, a, you know, the, the spread around the center uh, was actually quite uh, propitious because there is a a very interesting and powerful decomposition of this uh, localization functional uh, if you sum and subtract uh, the off-diagonal terms. Uh, so you can uh, take uh, this omega and add and subtract uh, this off-diagonal terms, uh, and so it can be identically written as the sum of what we call the, the omega i uh, functional and the omega tilde functional. Uh, and the, the beauty of this decomposition is that uh, omega tilde is trivially, you see, positive definite, uh, but omega i, and the i stands uh, for invariant, uh, has two very important properties. One is also positive uh, definite, uh, and so you see this also, as we knew, you know, the functional omega is going to be positive, but omega i is gauge invariant. So no matter what unitary transformations you do, omega i is not going uh, to change. And so when you try to localize uh, your uh, uh, Vanier functions, you're actually just uh, changing a representation that makes uh, these terms, uh, these uh, off-diagonal terms of the position operator as small as possible. Uh, the fact that omega i is uh, 
uh, gauge invariant and is positive definite uh, can be seen uh, quite simply uh, once uh, you introduce uh, the projection operators uh, on the occupied space uh, and its complement. Uh, so we'll use these operators P and Q uh, on, the, uh, on the rest of the Hilbert space. Uh, and basically, one can see, I will not go through the matter, that uh, uh, omega i can indeed uh, be written in terms of these uh, projection operators uh, that are invariant uh, for any gauge freedom. If, again, I put uh, transformations here, uh, what uh, I will have is that uh, they cancel out, unitary transformation, you, you dagger, uh, and so we uh, leave everything unchanged. Okay, so the, the, you know, the last element uh, in uh, calculating uh, this localization functional is indeed uh, dealing uh, with the position operator that, as you all know, uh, in a solid is ill-defined uh, because these integrals are ill-defined. Uh, same reason why we cannot apply a direct electric field. Uh, but luckily, you know, we could use uh, uh, the formulation in reciprocal space that was already developed in the 60s uh, by uh, Blount, uh, sort of showing how the position operator in real space, uh, what is written here in this uh, uh, square rectangle, uh, could be recast uh, as a quantity, and uh, you know, that uh, really was a sort of a premonition of uh, Berry phases and Berry connection uh, as an integral of the expectation value of the gradient operator in reciprocal space uh, over the periodic part uh, of uh, the block orbitals. So with this uh, operational definition uh, of uh, the position operator, one could work out uh, all the algebra in reciprocal space, uh, basically having to calculate uh, this expectation value uh, of, uh, of uh, the gradient. And for that, uh, we used uh, actually finite differences. So we discretize uh, our uh, periodic parts uh, of the uh, uh, block uh, uh, orbitals uh, on uh, the typical finite uh, discrete mesh in reciprocal space. Uh, let's think at a uh, regular Monkost pack mesh. And so we calculate uh, the gradient uh, with respect to K of U uh, by uh, calculating uh, what is uh, U, here it's written as F, uh, at a collection of K points, uh, K plus B, that are uh, very close uh, surrounding our point K. So uh, say if this was a one-dimensional system, uh, you know, you would just take uh, a K point a little bit to the right and a little bit to the left of your K vector. In reality, in three dimension, it can be written in a more uh, general ways, and that uh, gave us uh, the capability to calculate uh, this position operator uh, with uh, finite differences. And so the ingredients, again, that go into these finite differences are really the scalar products uh, between the periodic part of the wave function at a k point and its neighbors. And in terms of these uh, scalar products, uh, you can write out uh, what is the position operator what is the square, you can write uh, the localization functional, and uh, you can calculate uh, these objects uh, once for all at the beginning of your first principle, sorry, at the beginning of your post-processing, after you've done your first principle calculation, your electronic structure codes give you this, uh, and then you are going to evolve uh, at every K point uh, with those uh, unitary matrices U, uh, this uh, scalar product, uh, and this uh, will lead uh, to an evolution of the position operator and the uh, square of the position operator. And uh, what you want, uh, you want to find uh, a dynamics uh, such that these uh, unitary rotations uh, evolve, uh, bringing you to the minimum of that, uh, localization, uh, of that localization functional. So if we are going to do, say, uh, rotations uh, of the periodic part of uh, the block orbitals. Uh, what we really want are unitary matrices, uh, but uh, uh, we write it uh, in terms of, say, infinitesimal uh, rotations uh, that are anti-symmetric matrices, and we take uh, the gradient, uh, the derivative of the functional, 
uh, with respect to our unitary rotation. So once we have the gradient of the functional, uh, we know how to minimize the functional. We just take, uh, say, small step, uh, steepest descent, uh, conjugate gradient steps uh, in the direction of the gradient uh, until we get to the minimum. So it's a lot of algebra that I happily skip, uh, but if you want, it's all here. We have uh, the localization functional. Uh, we understand uh, how it can be calculated, uh, starting uh, from uh, our uh, uh, overlaps uh, uh, between the periodic part of the block orbitals. We can calculate uh, the position operator, uh, the square, and uh, we can calculate how it changes if we rotate uh, with a gauge freedom uh, the U and K at every K point, uh, and we are going to keep uh, rotating them until we get to the minimum. And uh, if we do that, again, uh, we might uh, take uh, silicon here, the four valence bands of silicon, uh, we put all this machinery in place, and lo and behold, uh, we get uh, the uh, maximally localized Vanier functions for silicon. We had four bands in a primitive cell. We get in this transformation four Vanier functions. If rather than silicon uh, we have gallium arsenide, uh, we basically get uh, the same thing, uh, a little bit more polarized towards the arsenic. If instead of uh, having a crystalline silicon we have amorphous silicon, we have something that uh, most of the times looks a little bit like a deformed silicon bonds, but sometimes uh, looks uh, a little bit more interesting, like in this uh, bottom corner. This was actually done by Marco Fornari, Maria Peresi, and Alfonso Baldereschi, also here in the department uh, 20 years ago. And uh, uh, even if we have used the periodic boundary language, if we were to deal uh, with, uh, uh, say, an isolated system, uh, the, 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 the mathematics of the position operator would work uh, sort of seamlessly. We would have just a gamma point, and uh, we would uh, calculate uh, the localized orbitals, recovering uh, what the chemist uh, had uh, found in the 1960s, and this would be the so-called uh, foster boys uh, uh, localized orbitals, uh, the, the criteria that in chemistry were developed were the foster boys that was the same uh, spread around uh, the center, or the... Um, uh, Raddington, Poplar, I forgot, and the Radders, no. There's an Edmiston, Rudenberg, criterion, the, the maximization of the self-interaction or the PPEC, MISA criterion. There are uh, sort of different ways. Okay, so this was, how much time do I have, Antimo, roughly 10 minutes, uh, is that, uh, okay. So, yeah, I, I wanted to go slowly here because it was important, even if, you know, two-thirds of you know this very well, to make sure we weren't, uh, losing anything, but you know, uh, once uh, we have this, uh, the, the question is uh, what to do with these uh, capabilities uh, to transform uh, block orbitals into localized uh, Vanier functions. Uh, and you know, a shopping list of what to do next, I've taken it uh, from our review of modern physics from 2012. Uh, a lot uh, will be discussed uh, in the next talks, I presume. Uh, Raffaele and David uh, will talk about polarization, magnetization, topological properties. I'll just give you a little bit of the flavor of uh, two or three of the things uh, that were, uh, uh, you know, some of the first applications and some that maybe are dearer to me. But of course, the, the, the first thing uh, that came natural uh, was uh, uh, using this uh, to analyze uh, chemical bonding. Uh, and uh, say, then out came a collaboration with Michele Parinello, of course at the time was uh, exploring very complex uh, liquid amorphous systems uh, with Car Parinello molecular dynamics. Uh, in this case, uh, generating, uh, you know, representative samples uh, of amorphous silicon. And uh, what the idea of Michele and Pierino Silvestrelli there was that, you know, we could use the centers of the Vanier functions uh, uh, almost as a chemical species and build a, a pair correlation function uh, not of atoms uh, but of atoms and Vanier function centers. Uh, so somehow, you know, a physical representation of where the electron should be, of where uh, the bond should be. So in addition, if you wanted to a silicon-silicon pair correlation function that you could study in experiments or a simulation, here we have as a solid line a silicon-Vanier function center uh, per correlation function, 
uh, that tells us that you know, there can be very interesting uh, lone pair states uh, that actually looked uh, very trivial if you weren't to look at the electrons from the point of view of ionic coordination. Uh, would look a very normal fourfold coordination for silicon, uh, but actually the Vanier function center uh, would uh, pinpoint uh, really an electronic nature of the defect. Or another example from the same group, uh, looking at uh, water and the uh, Vanier function really pointing out uh, uh, the lone pairs uh, in the, say, uh, hydrogen bonding network. The sort of, uh, I would say, last uh, step uh, in you know, this uh, uh, formulation of localized orbital for solids uh, came uh, once uh, Ivo Sousa joined uh, uh, David in Rutgers. I'd moved to work with Roberto Carr in Princeton. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the second step uh, was the so-called uh, disentanglement of bands, that is, you know, trying to build a localized representation of orbitals, not for insulator just for the occupied bands, but uh, for uh, uh, you know, a more uh, general set of orbitals that would span uh, you know, both the occupied and the conduction bands uh, where there is no separation of, uh, of, uh, of a gap. Of course, uh, when doing that, one loses the formal connection, maybe the intuitive connection to chemical bonding, and in particular, the formal connection of the Vanier function centers uh, uh, with respect uh, to the electrical polarization. So the question here is uh, how do you obtain a localized representation in cases like this, the case of copper, where uh, we have, uh, say, the D bands uh, that are all mixed up uh, with, uh, in this case, the parabolic uh, S band. And so how do you extract uh, from uh, this manifold uh, that at every K point is a variable a number of states, uh, uh, a subspace uh, of defined dimensionality, here a subspace uh, of dimension five uh, uh, that can be now transformed uh, with the vanillization algorithms uh, into localized uh, orbitals. And so the additional step that we had in this case was how to extract, uh, how to disentangle uh, from this spaghetti a, subspet, uh, a, sub, uh, 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 a subset of spaghetti uh, that was as meaningful as possible. And for us, meaningful means uh, that it gives rise uh, to localized orbitals. And again, uh, in order to properly vanierize the, these states, uh, what we wanted, uh, we wanted uh, that after here a five by five unit transformation, they would be as uh, smooth as possible as uh, we span uh, the Brian zone. And for this, uh, we use the concept uh, of spillage uh, that had actually probably been used uh, in many other uh, circumstances, but had been introduced uh, by Daniel Sanchez Portal and Miller Tacho and Jose Soler in the context of the Siesta project. Uh, and so our goal, uh, suppose that we have copper now at every uh, K point in the Brian zone, uh, we might have uh, the five uh, D states, uh, we might have the S state, uh, we have much more, so in general, at every K point here in the Brian zone, we have a lot of states, and maybe we wanted to extract a subspace of dimensionality five. So how do we extract a subspace blue of dimensionality five that is as smooth as possible? Well, we want to make sure that this subspace, as we surf across the Brian zone, changes character as little as possible so we have maximum overlap between S of K and this at all the nearby K points. So again, this is stating the problem and solving it at the same time because then it's basically just a, a numerics of finding an algorithm uh, that uh, selects out of uh, you know, any possible mixing of uh, 9, 10, 15 states, uh, a group of five states, uh, that uh, are going to be as smooth as possible as we surf around. Of course, you know, keep in mind that, that uh, you know, this uh, will mean uh, that we cannot represent uh, everywhere in the Brian zone perfectly our original band structure because we are now limited uh, from a dimensionality of five. And when there are uh, six states uh, mixed uh, all together, we are not going uh, to represent perfectly all those uh, all those, uh, all those bands. 
uh, but we have the tool to do this, uh, so we could take, uh, say, silicon and look at the bottom of the conduction band and say, rather than constructing the Vanier uh, transformation of the valence band that would give rise to the uh, uh, valence bonding orbitals, uh, let's try to get uh, from a certain energy windows uh, uh, four states out of uh, sometimes four, sometimes five, sometimes six, uh, the four states that have, uh, you know, give rise to the smoothest possible manifold as we serve the band, uh, and if we then uh, vanierize those states, uh, uh, we get something that looks uh, like uh, uh, anti-bonding orbital. And we put uh, everything together, the eight bands, and we would get uh, now, you know, linear combination of these that are as localized as possible, uh, so we get uh, sp3 orbitals. Or uh, we could play, say, with copper, as I said, we can decide uh, what to mix, and uh, if we mix uh, states that are uh, just in this uh, window here, uh, we get uh, something uh, that, uh, you know, once it's vanierized and with a target of five, uh, looks exactly like uh, the D bands of copper. Of course, if we were to mix uh, more blue states in order to get a manifold of dimensionality five, this would be more localized, but they would be less uh, physical. So here we can make our subspaces uh, smoother in K space uh, because we mix uh, high states here, but we actually make our Vanier functions less uh, physical. And uh, this gave us uh, the, the, the chance to do uh, you know, to play around uh, with energy windows in many different ways uh, and uh, creates uh, uh, localized states uh, capturing uh, whatever parts uh, in energy of uh, uh, the Brillouin zone that uh, we wanted. Okay, let me conclude. I had uh, three examples. I'll, uh, I'll skip uh, two of them because uh, I think there is just no time. I guess I was uh, very optimistic uh, for... Uh, for uh, for today, let me actually just mention that again is very dear to me, this, uh, the work that we did uh, uh, very early on uh, with uh, Alfonso Baldereschi, also here in Trieste and in Lausanne, uh, interfacing the, the early uh, uh, Vanier code with their own uh, FLAPW code that give rise to this concept of an interface of the Vanier code to post-process the result of any arbitrary electronic search and formulation. But let me just give you uh, one uh, recent example. So I'll skip this example of using uh, uh, Vanier function as building uh, blocks for the electronic structure problem. Uh, let me give you a, a, a later example. So this is work that uh, Jun Feng Chao will present more in detail later, but something that we have been very happy with, uh, and that is based on a very simple idea that is sustain, uh, substituting the concept uh, of using uh, an energy window to decide uh, what to keep uh, and what to disentangle, in choosing a projectability window in deciding what to keep and what to disentangle, basically projecting uh, the uh, Konecham states uh, onto localized uh, orbitals, uh, and deciding that if the projectability on those localized orbitals is very, very large, we should really keep those as they are in our vanierization, and if our projectability is uh, in between, is, uh, you know, some percent, uh, but not 100 percent, we should uh, work with them. And that gives a natural recipes, you know, in systems like graphene, where you have uh, bands that come from anti-bonding combination of sp3 orbitals, how to really separate uh, with, uh, you know, free electron-like bands that have nothing to do. And so this color codes, uh, you know, is a different definition rather than an energy window, but a projectability window of what to throw in into the disentanglement uh, recipe. And that uh, uh, can work very well because we can even do sort of, you know, a systematic sweep of uh, what is the uh, what are the threshold uh, for if you want uh, in projectability what used to be the frozen window and the outer window and uh, finding uh, for you know every material uh, what are the optimal projectability threshold and uh, uh, with this recipe uh, Jun Feng has actually calculated uh, 1.2 million maximally localized when you function for 18,000 inorganic materials. They all look like uh, very well 
uh, uh, localized and I think uh, we'll use this uh, a lot uh, in uh, going forward. So let me skip uh, also the last uh, topic. Uh, uh, let me go to the acknowledgement. Of course, you know, all of this uh, has really been made possible by uh, David Vanderbilt, you know, in his ideas, in his drive, uh, in getting me to do my dream of linear scaling as a postdoc in Rutgers. Uh, very soon, uh, Ivo Souza. Uh, was uh, involved in the work, uh, uh, and then uh, just a few years later, uh, Arash Mostofi and Jonathan Yates uh, came from Cambridge uh, to MIT and to Berkeley, uh, respectively. Uh, in later years, Giovanni Pizzi in Lausanne has given really uh, a drive uh, to, to keep pushing the code. And of course, there is an entire new generation of researchers that are all here today and uh, really have uh, made the code into you know, a community effort that they are driving. So the acknowledgements here actually go to the early stages of some of the applications that uh, ourself uh, we did. Of course, there is a, a website, and by now there are sort of review papers and Vanier code uh, review papers. So I think I've gone very, very long. So I thank you all uh, for your patience, and I leave you with some of the new colored Vanier function. And thank you, everyone. Okay, we have five to ten minutes for questions. Uh, let's start from the questions in presence and then we check maybe some of the directors uh, if you can check if there are questions on Zoom and then uh, we will unmute them from here. Yes. Um, can you hear? Me? Yeah, you can hear me. How, is there any way to um, check if the physicality of the Ivanu function is actually respected? Because we have to. How do we know that maximally localizing these functions is actually really what's, yeah. cor what's no. corresponding to reality? Yeah, this is the the million billion dollar question. Huh? So, and there are different answers. So. so First of all, if you want uh, a connections uh, to the real physical world, the true observable, we need to stay uh, on the side of constructing Vanier functions uh, from the occupied bands uh, of an insulator. So when we start constructing, uh, let's say, Vanier function uh, in a metal or mixing together uh, occupied and empty states, uh, uh, if we were to calculate any, say, expectation values on those orbitals, uh, it wouldn't be meaningful because uh, we are calculating an expectation value on something that has an arbitrary number of mixed up uh, uh, empty states uh, in there. It can be very useful uh, to mix up uh, the occupied and empty states, again, if we want to construct uh, a basis set, uh, that is, uh, if we want uh, to construct uh, Vanier functions, uh, like, uh, I don't know, this is not happening on my screen, but I hope you, can someone click that? Uh, yeah. I think someone, uh, oh, there is probably a presenter that is trying to present. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we should, and, oh, thanks, uh, and yeah, okay. we should tell that person not to present. Um, so, so you see these objects, this is a graphene, or in this case it's a nanotube. Uh, these objects are fantastic uh, to represent uh, the electronic structure of the nanotube, but uh, in particular, you know, they came uh, creating uh, this uh, purple mushroom-like, uh, PZ-like orbitals uh, sitting on every carbon atom that they are going to be very useful to represent uh, the Pi manifold of graphene or carbon nanotubes, uh, but you wouldn't want to calculate uh, uh, expectation values. So if instead uh, you take an insulator and you calculate the maximally localized Vanier functions, uh, so the two important exact statements uh, is that, uh, you know, those are just a double unitary transformation so you're still calculating the correct expectation values. Uh, 
And then uh, there is the connection made by David, uh, that is uh, the sum of the centers of the Vanier functions uh, corresponds uh, exactly to the polarization of the system. Now, these two statements uh, are valid, uh, to be honest, no matter what the localization recipe is, okay? So, in reality, it's the localization recipe that gives you some kind of heuristic chemical interpretation and some kind of heuristic physical interpretation of the bonding and of the local dielectric uh, field. But it is, even that is completely heuristic. It sort of makes a lot of sense, uh, but there is no one telling you there is anything right once you decompose a property of the entire occupied manifold into a property of individual Vanier functions. Uh, that's actually what, uh, you know, drove uh, in the 60s uh, the chemists uh, to explore uh, other localization criterion uh, rather than uh, the spread around the center that Foster and Boyce had introduced, uh, because uh, if you were to study CO2 and look at the Vanier functions of CO2, you would see a triple bond uh, on the C side towards the oxygen and the C side, oh, sorry, on C towards one oxygen and C towards the other oxygen that uh, the chemist didn't like at all. And uh, the edmiston rudenberg criterion of instead uh, maximizing the Coulomb self-interaction uh, was giving uh, uh, more uh, chemically intuitive uh, concepts. But of course, uh, you know, chemically intuitive uh, is not an expectation value, it's not an observable, in the same ways that uh, oxidation state, uh, you know, to a large extent uh, are not an observation value, to so the same sense uh, that uh, uh, CJT charges, you know, what is the charge around an atom, uh, is not a well-defined uh, concept. But you know, they, they work very well, so we are happy to close an eye or even two sometimes. Let's see if there are any questions on Zoom. If you are connected on Zoom, please raise your hand and then we'll unmute you for this. In the meantime, if any, okay. <laughs> Guess the problems. I just wanted to follow up with a comment, um, which uh, Nicola knows very well. There's a history of calculating the dipole moment of individual water molecules in liquid water by summing the Wannier center positions on the molecule and uh, then tracking that during molecular dynamics. This is Parnello Group and others. Uh, and that's an example where it became controversial at a certain point, because you're calculating something which is just not in principle an experimental measurable. There is no experiment in principle that can measure positions of 1A functions and can measure the dipole moment in the way that it was defined there. But nevertheless, it seems to be very useful in terms of understanding what's happening in liquid water. So we just agree that it's a useful concept and go ahead. Perhaps it is an extension of the previous question, but I just want to understand that I have it clear for myself. So if, if you have the insulator, then the one-year function of the valence band uh, give you the average position of the electrons, right? And, and that has connection to the electron density. Uh, but if I look at the Vanier functions of this uh, of, of these electrons, so does that somehow connect to the electron density, or is it just a, just some cloud that tells you they're somewhere here, but their shape uh, is is not really meaningful, or it depends on the way you you do the localization. Yeah. No. So the the charge density, the total charge density, is an observable, and uh, you can get it uh, exactly in two different ways, that is in the block representation, summing over all the occupied bands and summing and integrating over all the K points, or in the Vanier representation, you can sum over all the four Vanier functions and all their periodic images, 
and you will get uh, the same uh, physical object uh, that is the uh, uh, physical charge density. So the Vanier functions are, no matter if they are maximally localized, uh, almost maximally localized, localized in a different ways or poorly localized, uh, are still a unitary transformation of your states. Uh, so when you sum over everything in an occupied, uh, so in an insulator, you get exactly, you know, your expectation value, your total charge density. So they give rise to the exact total charge density that you had in your calculation. So they are an exact mapping, if you want, in that respect. I see. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, there is time for one last quick question. Was it? There are on your back. Huh? Ah. What is the shortest route? Uh, I want to ask uh, how important you consider is to to build the Vanier functions in the S uh, in the S or in the in the sigma bonds in carbon nanotubes in this example to describe the transport region to to study transport properties in these systems. So how, why did I choose that? Huh? No, sorry, what was the beginning of the question? How? Uh, if it's enough to, to uh, describe the, the P-set uh, bonds in these yeah. systems to yeah. uh, describe yeah. the transport yeah. region? Yeah. yeah, no, so wonderful. So, and uh, let me use, uh, so exactly our choice uh, was uh, to disentangle a set uh, that had uh, if you want, uh, for each unit cell, I think at this, again, as a graphing, it had uh, two covalent bonds, sorry, three covalent bonds uh, per unit cell and uh, one PZ orbital uh, for uh, each carbon. So we wanted uh, five objects uh, for each uh, unit cell. And the beauty of this, uh, so the target here is uh, five. Uh, we construct these many functions. This is what we get uh, as a basis set. Uh, and for this system, uh, because really there is a clear separation by symmetry with the antibonding orbitals, uh, this uh, minimal set of Vanier functions uh, works really perfectly. Because with just uh, those orbitals that you have seen uh, before, uh, you can now diagonalize the Hamiltonian in that basis. Uh, you get uh, uh, the black lines uh, that are basically exactly reproducing, uh, you see, both for a metallic nanotube and for a semiconducting nanotube, uh, the band structure that you would obtain uh, diagonalizing the Hamiltonian in an infinite uh, basis set of, you know, plane waves. Uh, and because the transport properties that matter are only about, uh, you know, one, two volts around the Fermi energy, you don't really need to describe uh, these parabolic bands here that are actually either uh, given by antibonding combination of sp3 orbitals or are just uh, the free electron bonds uh, like the interlayer state of graphite that again was discussed by Michel Posternak and Alfonso Baldereschi uh, 40 years ago. Okay, I think it's time to move to the next speaker. Let's thank Nicola again for the wonderful talk.